Look at this. <laughs> this is newly formed land. This is amazing. We are literally out in the middle of nothing. But two, three years ago, this started to form. And now they are planting mangrove trees here. And I love the feeling of the sediment on my feet, you know? It's nice to be all muddy. They're going to be planting these mangrove trees because it will stabilize this whole chore. It will also act as a protection. And they've got the foresight because they're already talking about settling people here, but in 20, 30 years. So this is something that is a longer term project to help the country and also use this space. And it's just amazing. I mean, whoa, it goes quite deep here. Not all of it is set. So you do go in a little bit deep and other points to your right on the top. But yeah, it's pretty amazing. Look how deep my foot goes. Incredible. By this point, my guides were pretty keen to get me to work. So we planted some mangrove seedlings first and then moved a little bit more inshore to plant some crops. So tell me a little bit about what you guys have been doing today. You've got some people here, haven't you? We are planting uh, seedlings yeah. here. Yeah. And after uh, 20 years, yeah. this will be stable and suitable for habitat. How do you feel about all this? Uh, I feel surprising. I'm surprising in, I'm working in forest, Bangladesh Forest Department yeah. and I'm surprised to do this type of job increasing land in Bangladesh and increasing biodiversity yeah. and this plantation is saving our lives in this coastal belt. Right, let's get to do some planting because that's what I'm here to do today. Help these boys, not that they need it. <laughs> this is hard work. <laughs> Fun but hard. If you have a look at my line, it's all wonky and then there's his straight so yeah, maybe I should stick to the day job. Well, I'm glad you did stick to your day job, Casa, um, <laughs> so that we can have you here today. And I mean, these wetlands are clearly helping people. They have new land that they can farm. But it also strikes me that this might help also protect them from things like cyclones, which climate change is going to make much more intense. Yeah, with these little chore islands that we've got off the mainland, when they plant these mangroves, make these mangrove forests and then these other tall tree forests in the middle of the Bay of Bengal, when you have these cyclones coming, they actually act as wave breaks. So you've got these huge waves and cyclones that aren't able to gather up momentum for miles and miles before hitting the coastline and hitting Bangladesh and these villages and these poor people's communities. Therefore, even though there will still be an impact, it will be far less than what it could have been. Earlier in the programme, we heard that wetlands were being destroyed three times faster than our forests. And I wonder, is Bangladesh the exception to the rule? It sounds like they're doing a lot to restore and even make new wetlands around half of Bangladesh uh, approximately is wetland but it is one of those places also that's really hard to monitor just how much wetland loss there has been because it is just an area that is constantly underwater in areas and there is so much flooding however what I do know about Bangladesh having been there is that there is so much urbanization going and when we've got these huge places like Dhaka which is an absolute sprawl. If you've not been there, it is such an assault on the senses. And it's just getting bigger every single year. And effectively, a lot of the land outside of that area is wetland in places, same in Silet, and then people are developing on this land. Therefore, we do have a lot of wetland being lost. Thanks so much for sharing your insights there, Cass. I really appreciate it. And so nice to speak to you again. Yeah, lovely to talk to you too. I can hear Casa's love of wetlands and I totally get it. I love them too. I remember visiting the Sundarbans on the Bangladeshi Indian border and just being awed by them, home to some very cocky monkeys if I remember rightly, and very elusive tigers. Countries like the UK where I live are beginning to recognise the importance of wetlands in the fight against climate change. Last August, the British government announced it was investing over 50 million pounds to restore 
35,000 hectares of peatlands around the UK, including the Fens. I think they're so important in our lives right now, more so than everybody realises, because their ability to capture carbon, that's really important. And the fact that you can create them so easily as well. You think rainforests, ancient woodlands are amazing habitats, amazing for carbon capture. They take hundreds of years to develop. But with wetlands, they're not too hard to create. They're kind of a, an easy win in some ways. They're what we need more of, for sure. Do you think they get a bit of a bad rap? Wetlands? Um, Boggy, soggy. Yeah, exactly. It's like anything. You have to be equipped for it. You need a good pair of wellies. I like wetlands because there's something calming about being by water and the life that it attracts as well. Some of these wonderful mammals like water voles, otters and birds that depend on water and thrive on it. It's sort of a magic world. I love exploring wet areas. takes us to the end of this edition of The Climate Question. I've been your host, Priya Jackson, and I just wanted to say thank you to all our guests, as well as our production team. They were producers Osman Iqbal and Octavia Woodward, production coordinator Brent Brown, series producer Simon Watts, editor Matt Willis, and sound design by Tom Brignall. This is the BBC World Service, hearing what people in Russia think about the war with Ukraine two years after the conflict started. It's fair to say that no one expected the fighting to last this long. My name is Oleg Boldarev, and I have been speaking about the war with Russians inside and outside the country. Two years of war. Voices from Russia. Tuesday at 9.30 and 20 GMT. In 50 minutes, witness history. We're going back 50 years to a story of kidnap and attempted robbery. In 2010, Louise Hidalgo told the tale of a stolen socialite that shocked America. Stay with us. iClick is next. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. up on the BBC World Service. It's Outlook with me, Asya Brooks. Today, we're with the artist Letizia T. She's based in the Ivory Coast and is known for a particular kind of art. It's made with an unusual medium, hair. I use my home hair, some hair extension, and some wire to create every type of shape that I want. Though today, Letizia is known for her hair sculptures, she didn't always have the best relationship with her hair or herself. And as a teenager, she struggled with an eating disorder. I went from a teenage hood where I was really thinking everything was wrong about me. The first thing I started to love about myself was my hair. The fact that I was loving this, this one thing helped me love all the other things that I had. Let us see story on how sculpting her hair helped her learn to love herself. That's coming up after the BBC News headlines. I'm Stuart McIntosh with the BBC News. Hello. The US House of Representatives has voted to impeach President Biden's Homeland Security Secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas. Republicans accuse him of failing to enforce immigration laws, resulting in a record surge of migrants across the Mexican border. Mr. Mayorkas says he's not to blame for a broken system that Congress has failed to fix. Peter Bowes has more. This is just the beginning. What happens next is that there will be a trial in the Senate, and the bar is much higher in the Senate. It has to be a two-thirds majority, and that seems extremely unlikely to happen. Now, the reaction from the other side, from the Democrats, indeed the Department of Homeland Security, reflecting what President Joe Biden has said, is that this is unconstitutional, that it's a petty political game. President Biden has forcefully condemned comments by his predecessor Donald Trump in which the former president said he would encourage Russia to invade NATO allies that didn't spend enough on defense. Mr. Biden denounced the remarks as shameful, dangerous and un-American. Here's Sarah Smith. 
Mr. Biden also made an impassioned plea to get a major foreign aid spending package passed in Congress, legislation that will send money to support the Ukrainian Defense Forces, as well as sending money to Israel and to support humanitarian aid for the Palestinian people. The bill has been approved by the Senate, but still needs to pass a vote in the House of Representatives, where many Republicans will not support the legislation because Donald Trump has said he opposes further funding for Ukraine. The Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, may refuse to table a vote on the aid package, which means it could be weeks or months before Congress sends the bill to President Biden for his signature, or it may not get passed at all. Indonesians are electing local and national politicians, including a new president to replace Joko Widodo. It's billed as the largest and most complex one-day election in the world, with more than 200 million eligible voters spread across hundreds of islands. Jonathan Head is in Jakarta. The front runner is this former Special Forces General, Prabowo Subianto. He's a very controversial character, and he's been ahead for a three to four months. So I think a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, given his character and his very different style, we'll probably get a very different direction. But in policy terms, all three of the presidential candidates have essentially said they can continue this moderate focus on development. So I don't think the voters are expecting a radical change in direction, just perhaps a, a big change in leadership style. The president of the Dominican Republic has warned that neighboring Haiti is on the verge of civil war. Luis Abinader told the UN Security Council that Haiti's collapse as a result of gang violence could soon become irreversible and the Dominican Republic would fight to avoid being dragged into the same abyss. The two nations share the Caribbean island of Hispaniola. You're listening to the latest world news from the BBC. United Nations officials have issued dire warnings against a proposed Israeli incursion into Rafah, the southernmost city in Gaza. The UN aid chief, Martin Griffiths, said it could lead to a slaughter. Over a million Palestinians are crammed into Rafah and have no other place to go. The spokesman for the UN Secretary General, Stefan Dujaric, echoed his concern. You have now over a million human beings crammed into Rafah into an extremely challenging situation, including with fighting going on around them. Any military operation in Rafah would be catastrophic, to say the least. A day of negotiations in Cairo on a new ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas has ended without a breakthrough. Scientists say they've compiled the first detailed proof that great apes like to tease each other. Video studies of four species, bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, showed behaviors in juveniles including elements of surprise and play. Evidence of mostly one-sided teasing included hair pulling, poking, and often an object that will whisper their way at the last moment. Italian climate change activists have plastered images of flooding on a glass protecting the Botticelli masterpiece in the Uffizi Museum in Florence. There was no damage to the 15th century painting of the Venus. Police arrested the pair, one of whom was one of the Italian authorities, on preparing to toughen the punishment of the protesters and to work to avert climate disaster, which Parliament recently increased penalties for anyone damaging the cultural monuments. The Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, says deep fake audio of him supposedly making inflammatory remarks almost caused serious disorder. Clip used artificial intelligence to create a replica of Mr. Khan's voice disparaging Armistice Day when Britain remembers its war day and also called for pro-Palestinian marches to take precedence. BBC News.
Letizia's styles and twists her coils and curls into shapes that seem impossible. A Christmas tree or a hand holding a phone trying to take a selfie. These sculptures can be serious or funny, playful or dark, sometimes all at the same time. Often, she uses her hair to tackle taboos around body image and sexual politics. A womb with two middle fingers instead of ovaries. An homage to Medusa, with her hair coiled into zigzag snakes. Today, Leticia has a massive following on social media, all thanks to her hair sculptures. But she didn't always have the best relationship with her hair. 